Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Pete Martins. He's a solar physicist at the physics department of Montana State University. He is developing with his colleagues 15 programs that use data from NASA Solar Dynamic Observatory and image processing techniques to identify features on the sun's surface that are going to tell us whether we're going to have sunspots, what the activity of the sun is, solar storms, which could wreak havoc on the earth. These are very, very important. All of you need to know that in 2008 and 2009, sunspots disappeared for about two years and the solar activity dropped to a hundred year low. This has a lot of implications on the Earth's weather and climate, and understanding and predicting solar minimums is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome our expert today, Pete Martins. Welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. Thank you, Kim. First of all, I want to hear about why you're doing what you're doing. Well, I love doing science. <laughs> That's uh, I love doing research, and I really like working with graduate students and see them, you know, grow intellectually and as uh, scientists. And um, when I was in my teens in the 60s, the race to the moon was going on, and that really inspired me to get into space science. Weather in space seems to be underplayed when it comes to the Earth's climate. What's your experience and expertise tell us? I think they actually got it about right. Initially, in the global circulation models for uh, Earth's climate, uh, the sun was totally ignored. The sun was just kept as constant all the time. And our observations over the last couple of decades, since the beginning of the space age, have shown that the sun is a remarkably constant in uh, the radiation it sends out. But there's a tiny variation, about one-tenth of a percent, over the solar cycle. And that does have a little bit of an influence on the Earth's climate. And you can actually calculate on the back of an envelope how much that would be. It would, um, so a 0.1% variation in solar output would result in about 0.1 degree Fahrenheit change in global temperature. And then when the global circulation model, models do the same calculation, they actually find double, 0 0.2, uh, 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And... The warming we've had in the last century, uh, mostly due to greenhouse gases, is about one degree Fahrenheit. So it, it's a contributor. The, the solar variation is significant, but it's not as big as the man-made variation. Huh. I wonder where you got that from. <laughs> well, as I said, both, both the global circulation models, they... they they uh, run them now with a varying sun from the observations that, that NASA provides. And then you can see how it influences climate. And then the, just a simple calculation you can do with... Sure. I just want to back up for a minute, and then I want you to talk about your uh -huh. work and your findings. So the climate that you're referring to is coming from models, not necessarily from actual data, but from simulation models. Well, predictions come from models. <laughs> right. I'm more talking about climate. I'm not talking about your work with the sun, and right. we'll get into that. But okay. right now, what you're referring to and the greenhouse gases and all that, I've done about 200 hours of work on everything connected to climate. And in okay. the last two years of my life, I have a very different perspective now than I did two years ago. I'm not saying I'm a physicist. I'm not saying that I can compete or am even in the realm of being able to talk with you. But I know that the sun has been drastically left out of the equation. The solar minimums and maximums and the cycle of climate has been left out of the entire dialogue worldwide on climate. Uh, yeah, it's not much part of the dialogue. I agree on that. And I think actually the people that run the climate models, they, uh, it's a political mistake to leave that area open because uh, now anyone can step in and say, hey, you're leaving this out, so your models aren't any good. What I learned also was that there was another piece, which is that there's empirical data, and then there's modeling and simulations. And when you don't know what the data is that's being put into the simulations and modeling, you don't know what you're working with, meaning the people that are relying on people that are doing simulations. It's not a very transparent process what those simulations are. That's been my experience of the two years. What I know is that there are at least seven different uh, global circulation models, 
And they all come out with pretty much the same prediction, that it's going to get warmer in the, in the present century. And they, all of them also are pretty good at uh, uh, simulating or reproducing the climate that we've seen in the last 200 years. Anyway, as far as the solar influence yeah. of global climate models, there's been a, a paper in Nature by a colleague of mine, Peter Foucault, who's a solar physicist. I forget, it's Nature or Science. Um, and they, run, they ran the global climate models using a variable sun, so as we think it varied up to four, uh, going back even four centuries ago to the Little Ice Age. And they found that the solar variation in the 17th century that we know from sunspots um, could indeed explain most of what's been observed during the Little Ice Age. That was in the 17th century, Europe Absolutely. quite a bit colder. And so, yeah, there is a solar influence. Right. It seems to be a big one in terms of the maximum or minimum. Would you explain to the audience what is a solar minimum? Oh, uh, the sun uh, exhibits sunspots, and a lot of activity is, goes parallel with the sunspots, so, such as solar flares, chrome mass ejections, etc., and that, all that activity has an 11-year cycle. So in 11 years, it grows in, in amplitude and number of sunspots, and then it uh, decays again more slowly and goes to what is called solar minimum when for a short time there is very little activity. And then the cycle starts over again. And uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat irregular cycle. The period is not exactly 11 years. It varies a little bit between between 10 and 12, and not all sunspot cycles are the same. The amplitude the varies also from cycle to cycle. But there's a, a basic clock ticking there, with a, which has an 11-year period. Many people say we are in a global cooling period right now, beginning of a global cooling period. Do you agree? No, they're dead wrong. Really? <laughs> Tell us what your view is, what your experience what? is. As for solar influence, we've had this deep minimum, and um, the 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 um, but the sun is coming back now. The cycle is uh, restarting, and we don't know yet how strong the cycle is going to be. But there is a cycle clearly, um, and you can actually see from the several years that there was very low activity, that there was some climate influence. That, for example, the the really cold winters they've had in in Britain, yes, probably have to do with that solar. Uh, activity. At least that's what the models show. So we're getting a turnaround now? Well, the sun is becoming active again. And, and anyway, the influence of the sun isn't that big compared to uh, mostly greenhouse gases. Interesting. Very, very interesting how you can say that. I look forward to having you on a panel, an international panel of people from different types of expertise and backgrounds. But talk about your work and what you're doing in the now in terms of the 15 different programs that you've been part of. At actually 16. Uh, 16. So it's a big international effort to uh, automate the recognition of events and features that we observe on the sun. And the reason for that is that, that this new NASA mission, Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, produces so many data, so much data, it's impossible to, to analyze those data in the old-fashioned way, which is just looking at the images and have graduate students work on them. We get about from just one of the three instruments on board, we get... 90,000 images a day, and that's like uh, one image every second in diff uh, sorry every 10 seconds in different eight different pass bands. So it's looking at it's like looking at eight movies in parallel. So in order to recognize features on there, uh, that's just too hard for humans. So we are writing computer codes that do that, and then put the data, uh, uh, create a sort of uh, catalog, say, for those data. And it's an international effort. We have five institutions in Europe that are participating and six here in the U.S. And, uh, well, I'm the head of that effort. But, uh, it, for example, in the U.S., we have Harvard and Johns Hopkins, Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama, and uh, Montana State collaborating. And tell us what oh, it's... and New Mexico State University, sorry. Oh, wow. Tell us what it's going to do now. What's going to happen from this? Okay, what you get is consistent databases of what is happening and of what has happened on the surface of the sun that we can observe. So you can do a kind of statistical research that was really labor-intensive in the past, and you can do that now 
fairly easily because all the data have been extracted again already. Um, so, for example, if you want to look at 